Hello everyone, uh, my name is Duncan Bruce. I'm the alumni manager at the National Film and Television School. Uh, thank you for all joining us for episode five of NFTS Backstories, which is in association with the BFI. Uh, this is a free masterclass and webinar that's open to everyone. And tonight we are joined by Sam Mendes, who will be interviewed by the director of the NFTS, who is John Wardle. Uh, if you'd like to ask any questions, John will be asking Sam those questions later in the evening, and you can use the Q&A function right at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, I'll disappear and hand over to John. Thank you, Duncan, and a uh, great pleasure to welcome you to this, everybody. Um, We've got an hour with Sam, and my intention is to ask him questions for about half an hour and then go to your questions. So absolutely do make use of the Q&A button because we'll, we will get to your questions. Um, just before I ask Sam my first question, I'm gonna embarrass him. Sam is a hugely acclaimed theater and film director. He's made some of my favorite films, but classic films, including American Beauty, Revolutionary Road, Jarhead, Road to Perdition, Bond films, 1917, and he's got a new film announced called Empire of Light, which maybe we'll ask Sam to tell us a little bit about later. He's been the artistic director of the Donmar Warehouse. He runs his own production company with a number of collaborators. And as of last week, um, Sam became an honorary fellow of the NFTS which we were hugely uh, pleased to do. We were so happy to be able to do it because Last year when the pandemic hit, um, everybody was scrabbling around trying to find a way forward. I reached out to Sam and asked Sam if he would be willing to do a masterclass. And he wrote back and said, that's just not enough. I need to do more than that. And ended up delivering 12 weeks of seminars for our fiction directors, which I think, you know, yes, the pandemic was bad, but that's something they'll remember for the rest of their lives. So I feel very, very grateful to Sam for that. So, um, Sam, uh, welcome. Thanks for doing this. Thank um, you, John. Yeah, it's lovely to be here. Lovely to be here. Well, I really want to talk about process with you. I want to talk as much about process as possible because I know you're really great on that. Um, so why don't we start off with how you come to pick projects? Um, and is it all about story or is there, always, is there something else going on uh, in terms of theme, you know, how, how do you come to settle on something that you're going to spend the next two or three years of your life on? You know, <clears throat> it's not, there is no sort of um, process that I apply to everything. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that as I've got older, the uh, criteria have changed somewhat in that I'm now much more likely to either develop or indeed write my own material. So the last, um, you know, I, I kind of, felt like I developed both the Bond movies with the writers um, from the ground up, you know, from day one. And I, you know, co-wrote 1917 with another alumnus of <clears throat> the NFTS, which is um, Christy Wilson Cairns. But I kind of, you know, wrote the treatment for that. And this new movie that I'm, I'm making next year, I've written in its entirety. So that has changed over the years. I used to treat um, scripts as I as I treat plays in that I would wait for a play to, or, or a movie script to come that I felt chimed with something personal. And in answer to your question, there's a sort of surface level. So I wanted to challenge myself visually um, and stylistically, but there's also a deeper level that I needed to communicate with me on, you know, in some way. And, and that I sort of would call the secret film in a way. And, and for that to work, it, it has to just be a very personal connection. It doesn't necessarily need to be made public. You don't need to go around telling everyone that's why I made American Beauty. But for me, looking back, American Beauty in many ways was about my childhood or my teenage years. I associated much more in that movie with the teenagers than I did with Lester Burnham and Carolyn Burnham with, with uh, Kevin Spacey and Annette Benning's characters. So for me, that was my way in. I, I grew up in, a, in suburbia, um, and although I knew nothing about American suburbia in, in the sense of what it was like specifically, the feeling in those houses, the feeling of the communication between us was very similar to my own upbringing. And I drew a lot from, from that personally. Road to Perdition was about my childhood, the feeling that you are always outside of um, the adult world, reaching to try and find a way in, you know, 
And then when I came to develop my own material, obviously I wrote from what I knew or, 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 or steered the authors towards what I knew. So Skyfall, for example, is about, you know, yes, it's a bomb movie. Yes, it's an action movie. But it's also about, you know, disappearing and Bond returning to find that everything has changed and and he's becoming um, surplus to requirements, which was my experience of being living in America for 10 years and then coming back to find that everything in a way had changed. Um, and so in a way, it's about middle age and mortality and about kind of an awareness of death. You know, M's character, Judy Dench's character, M dies obviously in the movie and that was a big thing. It was one of the reasons why I ended up doing the movie. So all of those things go into the choice and then there's just this sort of just this gut feeling, you know, that feeling that you want where you think if anyone else did this movie, I would be jealous. You know, I don't. This is my movie. Um, and I felt that about American Beauty. And it seems ridiculous. And I hadn't made a movie at all at the time to be so arrogant as to say this is my movie and no one else's. But I felt I knew how to do it in my gut. Um, and, and that's what that's what led me towards something that was such an unusual choice for a first movie, something so far away from home you know, leaving home, leaving and going to America and working on an original screenplay that really had no direct bearing on, on my own life in, in an obvious way. <clears throat> talk briefly, just before we talk about your work as a director, talk briefly about your, your bird's new work now as a screenwriter, because I, I heard you do a Q&A where you said, um, you, you described the process of writing 1917 and it, and it felt very much like you were trying to, you were, use cards, is that right? You were using cards yeah, to make yeah, notes of yeah. moment. Do you want to tell, maybe tell the audience a bit about how you approach that? Because I got the sense that you were slightly intimidated by the blank page. Yeah, I was. I, well, intimidated is the wrong word. I just think kind of overwhelmed by it, the feeling, oh, God, I've got to write everything myself. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to write page one, scene one, oh, my God, you know. And I knew what the story was. I mean, I that was an odd... Um, writing process 1917 in my own head because what I had was an image of my grandfather. My grandfather told me stories. He was a he was a um, force in the First World War, and um, he told some extraordinary stories to us when we were children, and they never left me. And I had this image of my grandfather. You know, he, he had to carry a message from one post to the other, and he in the quickest way was to go across no man's land at dusk. And I had this image of a little man. He was a very small man running with that message through that kind of those fields of carnage and death. And I felt like that was a movie and I couldn't quite uh, work out how uh, I could make a movie about a sick. My, my feeling was, what if that man kept going? What if he just kept running? What if that was the movie, that one journey? But of course, the First World War was a was a movie, of, was, was a war of stasis. Uh, and, you know, everyone was running sideways in the, you know, they, they, they spend years getting 200 yards, you know. Um, so how was I going to make a movie about someone on a journey through a war that was not, that had no journeys in it? So I kind of stalled for a bit. Um, and, but I had all these scenes, I had all these ideas. Well, well what if this happened? What if they, you know, I, I, I just, you couldn't find a narrative structure. Anyway, eventually I stumbled on the fact that, you know, during the 1917, the year of 1917, um, the Germans retreat to the Hindenburg line and overnight they abandon all the land that they fought for, great swathes of land. And, and this was the land that he could cross, but he wouldn't know where he was going. The Germans had left snipers, booby traps, blah, blah, blah. Suddenly the movie opened up and I was able to write all the scenes that I wanted out onto cards. And then I moved them around and tried to work out what order they might happen in. So in a way I was going outside in. And then I wrote a treatment based on that. And then I stalled. And then I found Christy, who I'd worked with on another project, and she really did the legwork of getting it down onto the page. And then I rewrote and we went back and forth. It was a very enjoyable process. Um, but I was able to, uh, I mean, in a way, it, it's both more complicated and simpler. It has to be linear. One thing had to follow another. There was no parallel action. I couldn't cut away. It was all in the moment. It had to take place in real time. So there were many things that just weren't possible. Uh, and, and I had to follow the landscape. You know, you had to... OK, if you have to get to the front line, then you have to cross no man's land, then you're into the German lines, then the land behind the German lines, then into farmhouses and fields and unspoiled countryside, you know, and then into the towns, maybe the villages, crossing the rivers, you know, and it all made that and then to the new line. So I, I had a shape there and that made it quite straightforward. This new movie <clears throat> is much more complicated in a way because it's 
you know multiple stories and and um and i had to cut yeah. <laughs> I had to acknowledge the existence of editing which i didn't in the in the first movie and is this your first you've written this on your own without a, without screenwriting collaboration yeah. so how how did you find that well uh, i uh the actual re the truth was it was locked down and i had to have a foot operation and i had to st i was locked into my room i wasn't locked into it although my family i'm sure would have been delighted had i been locked in i did so much moaning and grumbling um so i was in a sort of lockdown within a lockdown <laughs> i wasn't I, it wasn't just that i wasn't allowed out of the house i wasn't allowed out of the room i'm yeah. actually my foot up like this so i thought and i frankly i just couldn't face watching stuff and i thought i've got this idea it came to me in december and it was a um it was areas i wanted to be I'd, I'd, I'd wanted to write about but i couldn't find where it took place in my head um and when i found the location in my head which is a an old cinema on the south coast of england <clears throat> everything's in, and that my central character works there i thought okay i i know how to make this work now and and i'm going to start writing and see what happens and I just sort of edged forward gradually. I wrote it with Olivia Coleman in mind. Um, and then halfway through, I hit a brick wall. I thought, I, I don't know where to go here. I'm not sure which direction to go in. I was sort of losing the center of the film. Stalled for about three weeks, was even more grumpy than usual. Um, and then I thought, I know what I need to do. I need to ring Olivia Coleman and say, I'm writing a movie for you and just talk to her. Not, not, not pick her brains particularly, but I didn't really know Olivia very well. I mean, I've met her before, but not to and she had no idea i was busy writing a movie for her so i thought i better tell her just in case she's not free or something <laughs> so we had a chat very pleasant chat didn't talk about much except just sort of gossip and what have you but that really helped me i i, I thought oh yes there she is that's the person that i'm is in living in my head all this time and that got me out of that block and then i wrote the rest of it in about a month um, and again, because you don't write with someone, you just don't know if it's, you know, yeah. it could be shit. You know what I mean? You just think. Oh, I was going to say, what's your process, Sam? Do you share it? How, what, I do, with, share with it? great hesitancy, with sort of a mixture of pride and nerves. I like, I've written something, you know, don't hate it. But I, I sent it to Pippa Harris, who, who is who produced 1917 and is, is, runs Neil Street with me on the film side. And I sent it to my agent, Beth. Um, and I sent it to Julie, who used to be my assistant, it's now our development. So three powerful and brainy women, basically. Um, that's obviously having read it already to my wife in bits. So that's four brainy and powerful women. Um, and they all seemed to like it. So, and thought it was what I should be doing. Because I was, you know, I said, is this the thing? Because it's quite different from 1917. It's a small movie. It's an independent film. You know, it's not. It's not got the element of action and scale that the last three movies have had. It's much more like an American Beauty type scale of movie. Um, and then I sent it to Roger Deakins, of course, who's my chief collaborator. And he loved it and, and saw it immediately. And, um, and that was really the thing that made me think, yeah, okay, well, we're, we're gonna do this. You know, Frankly, these days, if Roger Deakins says something, yes to something, it's worth doing it just for that. You know what I mean? Uh, I'll do it just a yeah. Let's see what Roger does with this. You know, I'll just turn up. But you know, so and, and Sam, you you wrote so basically you wrote it on spec. Nobody's paying you to do this. So is that something you recommend? Is is kind of going away and developing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The reason, if you can afford to, obviously it's better because particularly if you want to be a writer director, um, I think you know to control the material is very very you know just to be able to take it around the place and say. You can make this script if you love it, but I have to direct it. You, you know, I, you can't give it to someone else. Which, you know, looking back would be how Soderbergh began, or Paul Thomas Anderson began, or whatever. You know, or, or Quentin Tarantino, just by saying, "Look, you know, this is the script, but you can't have it unless I'm directing it." And that is clearly the best way. But people develop at different stages and in different ways. I never would have said ten years ago, I would have ended up writing some of my own movies. I don't think I'm going to write every movie I make, but just that, that you know there's a part of me that knows the kind of thing I want to do. And as you get further along in your career, the options narrow because you've made your war movie, you've made your gangster film, your action movie. So these things become less interesting to you, you know, and you want something to challenge you. So you end up, that window gets narrower and narrower. And in the end you think, well, I'm, if I want to make that kind of movie, I better write it myself. And that's what I felt about 1917. You know, 
the energy I would have expended describing the movie to another writer, we better better use just putting it down on paper. And so if you'd read the script for 1917, you would have read basically a description of the movie as much as a script, if that makes sense. It's yeah. like, you know, because there's no, there were no, there were no scene breaks at all. It was just one long description um, and it wasn't very much dialogue. So in a way it was almost like reading a story. And I was very, I was very struck. I remember <clears throat> that's how Bergman used to write some of his scripts in the mid period. You know, I think movies like, um, uh, uh, face, uh, uh, um, um, uh, oh God, I've got my bloody name of it now. Um, uh, Sawdust and Tinsel, for example, he wrote as a short story. Um, and, you know, he, he just didn't have, and he gave that to the crew and said, this is, this is what I'm making. And they would break it. I mean, obviously the very small, very intimate crew and, and the cinematographer, a great cinematographer who he knew intimately as well. And that does help. But you're always trying to get back to the sort of purest form of storytelling and, and to try and shake off some of the sort of received notions of this is how things must happen. You know, uh, I, I never particularly adhered to the three act structure, for example, and 1917 doesn't absolutely not have a three act structure. Neither does American Beauty. Um, you know, they just don't work like that. This one I've just written does a bit more. Um, and sometimes you think, and the Bond movies did very much. You know, I, I, I talked about them very much as a sort of almost pieces of engineering. You know, I remember saying, you know, opening action sequence, middle action sequence, ending action sequence, couple of sweeteners in between, you know, maybe a gunfight or a, or a fist fight or, a, you know, um, one of them has to be a little bit comic and one of them has to be a bit serious, you know, all of those things. And then, you know, you've got the MI6 storyline, you've got the women who have to arrive into the plot, you've got Bond's own personal journey and you have to marry all these things up and you have to thread the needle, the, the sort of absurd in a way needle of, well, you can't do the snow because they did that two movies ago. You can't go to Italy, you can't go to, you know, and, and because we did, oh no, we did that. Maybe it's time to go to Venice again. We haven't done that since Moonraker or, oh no, we did it in Casino Royale, you know. All that sort of stuff that so you, you you've got these absurd sort of giant moving pieces in the end on spectre i remember saying to barbara and michael well where did, where can we go <laughs> because either we've been there on skyfall or we weren't allowed to go there the world is a tricky place to shoot it these days you know i mean marvel solve it by never going anywhere and just doing everything green screen you know and, and fair enough that's but bond can't do that bond has to exist in a real world and he's by definition globe trotting and aspirational you know and so you have to go somewhere. And they said, well, we've never been to Rome. And I was like, right, okay, deal, let's go to Rome. <laughs> and we did, we, it was like, had a you know, car chase in front of the Vatican, no problem. <laughs> but it was sort of a little bit like, you know, you're, you're sort of trying to find things that fit within the myth that is Bond over 25 movies. And that's a very different way to operate to something like 1917, where you're being super specific moment to moment. And you know, you would accept, accept no other option. When you get to the point of kind of crewing up, thinking about your kind of key collaborators, whether it's Roger, or cinematographer, or Dennis Gassner, or your costume designer, how much do you, what, what's your process? Do you send them the script and lots of information about how you see the movie? What, what's your starting point for kind of bringing them into the mix? I mean, I was very lucky with my, my cinematographer has always been my number one collaborator. And I, I I put a lot of stress on the visual in, in any movie and, and I find that that is often the thing that excites me the most early on. You know, ooh, the, you know, the images that come to you, the way in which a, a, a style develops organically as you talk to the cinematographer and you begin to understand actually what we need here is handheld or we, we want something rougher or we want to use different kind of stock. We want, to, we want the thing to flow. We want it to be steady cam. We want it all on tracks. So we want it to be, to have no moving cameras or whatever that is part of that's one of the most exciting things about making a movie and it was interesting with empire of light with the one i've just written that it took me a while to get out of my writer's brain but i didn't write unlike 1917 i, I wasn't writing um scenes as i wanted them to be directed i was writing scenes as i felt they ought to be played between the characters and what was right for the me mechanics of the characters in, the, in a particular situation psychologically and then only later on, when I started talking to Roger, did I think, how am I going to shoot this scene to articulate the thing, to pull out of it what I think needs to be pulled out? But I didn't 
right with my director brain at all. I, I kind of almost put it to one side. Um, so for, for me, choosing a collaborator is you want somebody who, you know, you just got to hit it off, um, you know, and spend a bit of time with your cinematographer, go and see a movie with them, natter, gossip, have a meal, whatever. <clears throat> and I was very lucky. Conrad Hall, who shot American Beauty, was one of the great cinematographers yeah. of all time. And, and he just it happened to be the right time in his life. He was in his 60s. You know, I was just starting out. We got on very well. He was excited by my ideas. In answer to your question, I don't give them my I don't send a script and loads of storyboards and say, what about, you know, and, and a lookbook. That I wait until I know that I'm interested to work with them. And then I will say, this is how I kind of think it should feel. But are you also, <laughs> trying, to, are you also trying to capture that first reaction? Is that part of working out whether they're the right fit is to kind of send them the script and say, what did you think? Is that kind of part of you selecting them? To I care very much. I mean, I care very much what my collaborators think of, of the movie. And I, I was very, <clears throat> you know, um, I, 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 it was a key moment for me when Roger said, Roger Deakin said yes to Skyfall, for example, because I wanted to make a movie movie, not a Bond movie. I wanted to make a movie that I felt would stand, would stand on its own two feet you know, whether it had Bond in it or not. Yeah. And I needed to look not like a Bond movie, a conventional, what I felt a conventional Bond movie was at that point. That's no disparagement to any of the previous Bond movies, but I just wanted it to be very particular. And Roger saying yes to it immediately gave me that confidence that it was going to be that. So you sometimes you have that, that feeling of their approbation, their praise or their feeling of positivity about your project launches your own, you know, real journey into the movie. Um, you know, I, I would work um, not quite as intensively with the production designer, but Dennis Gaston has been a great collaborator over the years, started work with him on Road to Perdition, did Jarhead, Skyfall, Spectre, 1917. Um, and the other person who's come into my life relatively recently is the editor, Lee Smith. And I, I think I had not bad luck with editors, but, you know, just didn't quite gel with anybody. We, you know, I worked with some fantastic and, and really brilliant and the interesting people, Tariq Anwar um, was one of them, and another was the great Walter Murch, you know, but it just didn't feel comfortable in the way that, you know, it just didn't feel quite right. And then I met Lee, and and um, Lee, I don't know if you know, you know, he's edited all, he edited all the Christopher Nolan movies up to Dunkirk. Yeah. And um, he's an artist, but he has the sort of spirit of a, of a, of a, of an Aussie who's just rolled off the beach, you know what I mean? But he's got an incredible brain, a storytelling brain, He's, he never patronizes the audience. He runs ahead of them, but he doesn't, you know, he helps them too. You know, he's just a, but he's, he's got an eye, an incredible eye and, um, and a great judge of a take too. Um, and he on 1917 was key for me because there were two or three occasions when I felt I hadn't got it. And I called him and said, have I got it? And he went, no, not really. And to have the courage to say that to a director and to know why he, he used one very brilliant phrase at one point. He said, I felt, we, I felt detached from that scene. And I was like, that's all you need to say. I know exactly what you mean. I know what the problem is. I know I put the camera in the wrong place. I know why you feel detached. Let me go back and do it again. But that kind of collaborator who's strong enough to tell you very gently, that doesn't work. And Roger obviously would do that, um, and but not many others. Um, and the other one was, is Tom Newman, who, who's my composer yeah. and composed everything up to 1917. Similarly, you know, we have a, it's feisty, you know, and at times a little bit combative and is always down to the wire, um, but somehow it works, you know. Um, let's talk briefly, because I'm conscious we're almost at the end of my half now. Let's talk briefly about working with, with actors. I wonder whether you might just talk a bit about your, how your background in, it seems so obvious, but how your background in theatre has either been a hindrance or a help when it comes to transposing that into movies. Um, sometimes a hindrance, early on a hindrance, because, well, a little bit, because I'm so used to talking with actors at great length about things before doing things, round a table, chatting, yeah. you know, and sometimes I over talk. And in the early days, I think I gave an actor, actors too much information before they had a chance to do things. You know, film actor comes fully prepared to give a performance on the day. Um, a theatre actor never really does that until the final run through in the rehearsal room. So I didn't have the confidence early on to just let them do it for two or three, four takes. The thing that they'd planned, prepared, 
watch it carefully, think about what they've chosen to do, and then make comment. Now, now I would, I would, I would not speak too soon. I, I would, I would trust that if we discussed the scene earlier on, whenever they knew what the movie was and knew I was going to shoot it, that that most nine times out of ten, they, they they would be in the right territory and they would only need a little bit of steering here or there. And that's what I would do now. Early on, I think with with actors, I I think I spoke too soon, you know. And I think it's a great lesson. Uh, as a director or, or, or as anyone in film is just take a step back and watch what people are doing before you leap in and tell them what you want it to be you know and often it's better than what you imagine anyway or they're trying something and you think oh that's really interesting let's just take that a stage further now you've done that you give me this idea and one thing leads to another and the beginning of the dialogue in film tends to be the actor doing something and then you responding beginning of the dialogue in theater is you suggesting cajoling and then gradually teasing a performance out of the actor who's much more you know um uh, m much less eager to, to 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 leap into the middle of it you know because he's got lots of time he or she has lots of time and so so recently i've, I've been much more um watchful and i think also i mean for example i'll give you an example at the end of 1917 um the last shot effectively in 1917, which you know was one take, was from the scene with Richard Manton, who's the brother of Dean yeah. Chapman, who he has to tell his brother, George Mackay's character, Scofield has to say his brother's dead. And then it follows him across a field of high meadow grass and sit by a tree and the camera circles the tree and he has to lie back, he has to open his wallet and take out photo of his, um, actually it's a tobacco tin, take the photo of his family. And it's the first time you see it. And then, as I wrote in the script, he closes his eyes and feels the sun on his face. That, that's the other. And that is, you know, and I got a lot of questions, you know, how did you, you know, what, how, how would you direct George in that scene? And the answer is, I didn't direct him at all. He read the script, he played the part up to that point, he knew exactly what to do. And that was the first take, if you can believe it. You know, it just was brilliantly operated. George was brilliant. And as he sat down at the tree, the sun came out. I mean, you know, sometimes people, someone's just looking down at you. And I did say to Roger, I knew you were good lighting, but I didn't know you had God on your side. Well. I mean, it was literally like he'd switched the sun on <laughs> exactly the right moment. So, you know, that sort of stuff, if you've prepared it, yeah. it's so situational. It's so, it's so, the, the actor is fed by so many things. You need to allow that to happen. They must be thinking, what would Sam want me to do here? They must be thinking, what would the character do how does it feel in this field? How does it feel? The feeling of the bark against the back of my head, the feeling of resting finally, of how 20, you know, three hours ago I was a different person and now I've lost my friend and I'm going home. I mean, it, all of those things going around, you know, and of course, you know, me waffling on in his ear just before he does it, it's not going to help. You know, you want to release him. You don't want to make him hear your voice in his head. If he'd struggled or there had been something wrong or he lifted his head at the wrong time or anything, I would have just said, you know, I would have just given him. But again, I wouldn't have ever talked. And this is for all the people out there. Never talk about effects. I want them to feel this here. No, that's not how what what's the note? You, you know what you want the audience to feel, but don't make that the actor's burden. You say, OK, he's he looks a little angry here. Um, and and so some and it, you know or or cross or or troubled you know, and you find a way of articulating. Listen, in this moment, it's like he can breathe again. You know, his his chest opens. He's he sees the photos of his kids, and he he melts. Whatever you know, find another way to get rid of the knot in his brow or shift his energy down. You know, sometimes I'll say to an actor, Kazan, who was a great director of actors. And a, flaw, a flawed human being, but I think one of the great directors of all time, said there are some actors you need to lay hands on, like a horse, you know, to settle them. And, and I think that's very, sometimes you do, you just need to say, it's, you know, and it doesn't have to be words. It's just like, it's okay. I'm here, I'm with you. I'll help you to get where you, but just breathe, yeah. <laughs> breathe, you know, and shift your energy from here, which is where a lot of actors are, is down into your gut. You know, shift energy down, feel your own weight on the ground. All of those things, look around, feel the environment, take what the environment can give you. This is why I hate green screen. Yeah. You know, 
fucking it takes, takes confidence to do that though sam doesn't it so, as you said rather than to rush in with notes and in a weird way it's, it takes confidence. It takes more confidence to say nothing often the other the other thing i think i read that you said is that when you made the move to move um that sound was kind of this this like amazing pandora's box that opened up so you could so talk, talk a bit about that in terms of the difference between theater and film because it hadn't occurred to me until the hotel yeah, my obsession with sound is about dynamic and and if you don't understand what i mean what i mean is you can be very quiet and very loud and often one helps the other the dynamic range of a film you know that you can control silence just one you can have one track of all your tracks playing which is just the sound of wind or a, you know or a very distant dog bark or absolute silence and out of that emerges now i employed that in in movies that are not used to being treated in that way i'm not saying it was it was genius many people have done it way better than me but skyfall is a brilliant piece of sound design you know as i think is 1917 and i credit the sound department of both movies um but a lot of it is to do with being able to make the movie breathe in and breathe out you know um i think one of the scourges of big scale movie making or any movie making is incessant noise you know incessant and it, it, it's it's fear-based it's, it's panic it's what they in the theater call flop sweat you know the sweat that breaks out on someone's brow when they think that their the effort will will stop this play being a flop you know and it won't it just makes it a louder flop you know and and that's the problem with sound design it's like shit this isn't working turn up the fucking volume and it, it that's not the way to go you know um you need to mold it craft it you need to have the courage to cut the music so that when the music comes in it has value it has meaning and it has an emotional impact otherwise it's just oral wallpaper now I've been guilty of that. The, first, the opening sequence of Skyfall, for example, ten minutes or eight minutes, whatever it is, is overscored. You know, it's just it's just incessant. You know, it's just a, you know, it didn't have a shape orally. It, it, it's both noisy and overscored. Now it, it's interesting in lots of other ways. Action-wise, it's a really inventive sequence, and it, and it and every time I see, it, I think, wow, you know, it's ballsy. This, you know, it's a series of Russian dolls. You think it's a car chase? No, it's not. It's a motorbike chase across the rooftops of the Grand Bazaar. Oh, no, it's not. It's on the top of a train. Oh, he's in a digger. Oh, now it's a fist fight, you know, and then he gets shot. So all of these things, so it, it kind of develops in an interesting way, but it doesn't have a proper dynamic range as a sequence. The opening sequence of Spectre, which is a less good movie as a whole, in my opinion, is, is a much better put together piece of sound design and sort of sculpture. You know, you have source music you have periods of silence periods of stillness you have a long opening shot and then you have a foot chase and then it, it slows down suddenly as they get to the area where there's police and they have to walk through it then it goes into the helicopter and it's only when you hit the helicopter and when the fight begins in the helicopter the score kicks in and when it kicks in it i think it makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up because you haven't heard any music up to that point other than the source music in the in the, in the streets so it just feels it just feels much more controlled and much more shaped and that's what i mean by and and i suppose if i did the reason i did the second movie for bond was i felt like i still had things that i could do better you know and that was one of them um there weren't many and and it wasn't as good a story i think that was that was the script wasn't finished when we went into production which is not something i would advise anyone to do but um it's not his fault by the way it was just that sometimes these things happen you know things yeah. You know fall apart in in odd ways yeah right well let's get to i've got loads of things i could ask you but let's get to some of the audience questions so robin's got a question she says or he says my question is can you describe a time you made a mistake in duties of a director and how did you rectify it gosh i've made loads of mistakes um <laughs> That's really, I reckon that's very reassuring for people to hear. So. Oh, no, no, I mean, I mean that, and in in I'm not being falsely modest. I, I, but I think the most key thing is recognizing you've made a mistake quickly, if you possibly can. I mean, I've learned over the years that what I do is I tend to go back to my hotel room or wherever I'm staying, and I sort of do something else. I'll watch the, the foot, foot, the football, or I'll, you know, anything to take my mind off it. You know, or you know, I'll phone the kids, whatever. 
And then at some point in the evening, a little man will pop up on my shoulder and go, I don't think you got it today. I don't think you got it. I think you fucked that, you know. And if he doesn't pop up on the whole, you know, maybe it's okay. And so I would say, so on 1917, for example, the scene in the back of the truck with all the men, I reshot the whole scene entirely. The scene at the field hospital at the end of the movie, I reshot all that entirely. But I did both of those scenes probably a week after I shot the first version. I just knew it, it didn't work. And I did that on American Beauty. I've done it. But I, what I've never done is wrap a movie, put it together, and then go back and do reshoot. I tend to know that I've made a mistake quite quickly and want to rectify it. it. It's almost embarrassing to me. It's like, I have to do that scene again. It was so bad. I know exactly how to do it now. Get out of my way. I want to reschedule that. You know, I promise I'll do it in a, d twice the speed. And it's often, you know, it, put the camera in the wrong place. Don't quite come, you know, you, you had an idea. It didn't quite work. You weren't accepted on the day. You're trying to force it, force it, force it. And at the end of the day, it's like, mm, it kind of works, but not really. And, um, and as I've got older, I've been more willing to acknowledge my mistakes in the moment. I think the big thing to guard against is, is, is being so determined to convince everyone around you that you are, know what you're doing, that you don't ask yourself whether you like it or not. You know what I mean? It, it, because it's, it's not a sign of weakness to admit you've made a mistake. That, that is really important. You have to accept, you know, I made a mistake. I'm going, I know exactly how to do it now. And that weirdly will breed a lot of confidence in people if you do it in the right way, at the right time, in the right spirit. Of course, you don't want to derail the whole movie and you can't reshoot every scene. You, you know, but one or two scenes, admitting that you, you and it's key, you know, I, it's key that I get this right, you know. And the same goes, sometimes you miss a shot or two and you think, I have to go back, I have to go back, I missed a close-up, you know, or I missed a key moment or I got them playing it wrong or something. Uh, very rarely I, I, I would actually, in one movie, which I won't mention, I, I actually self-destructed an entire scene so that I, I would have to shoot it again. But I didn't tell the actors that's what I was doing. <laughs> it was just for reasons I won't bore you with now, but I just made it impossible for the scene to work. Do you now, Sam, knowing this about yourself, do you, when you think about schedule, build in a bit of time for that? You know, if you're thinking about the schedule for Empire of Light, are you thinking, well, I need a couple of days where I can go back to things? Or weirdly, no. I I I trust that I will. I trust that I will catch up in other areas, um, and that's what we did on 1917. I mean, we built in a very it was a very old schedule 1917 because we couldn't shoot when it was sunny and we couldn't shoot when it was raining. So we knew that we would have all this time, and if the weather was good to us, which it was, we we would we would come in under, and we did. We came in under schedule, under budget, because we just got the right weather it was just completely it was a it was a a, a fluke you know had we shot last summer the summer after the, the movie we shot we would still be going because the weather was it was sunny every day for, for the yeah. three we would have been absolutely stuffed that's just how it went <coughs> nicholas who says uh, how much of your job responsibilities changed since directing american beauty because now you're writing directing producing in fact I've heard you say as well, you've probably got more producing credits than anything else on your IMDb, haven't you? So what, what's changed for you in terms of when you made American Beauty and what your role is now in movies? Or is it essentially still the same thing? It's essentially still the same. I mean, with the exception of the writing, um, I, I, I feel that it, it, it's just I know more about what everybody else does um, and that is both good and bad. I mean, it's good in that, you know, you're much more in tune with the crew. You're much more respectful of people's individual jobs. You know, um, I think generally speaking, it's a much better atmosphere on sets these days, much more, much kinder and more aware of, you know, um, uh, the, you know, the, this, it's, it's a much more gentle atmosphere, I think. I found this. Um, but at the same time, a certain amount of selective blindness is not bad in directing. You shouldn't need to know how everyone does their jobs. You describe what you need to see, and it's other people's jobs to try and create that. Um, so sometimes you can load yourself down with too much technical information. I mean, there are some directors who would, who would absolutely disagree with me on that. I mean, I think of somebody like David Fincher, yeah. 
you know, you would say, why wouldn't I want to know every what everyone's job is? You know, that's my job yeah. to know whatever. But I don't always agree with that. I think <clears throat> it can add to the white noise, and sometimes you just want to see. What about on the producing side of things? What about on the producing side of things? <clears throat> I guess on American Beauty, you. I didn't produce American Beauty. Um, me, so. No, I, I think that I, I don't relish dealing with the studios in terms of if you go over time, over budget. And I very much didn't produce the Bond movies. I think they protected me brilliantly from any uh, external studio pressures. And I wouldn't have wanted to. It's too big a job. Um, with 1917, I felt like um, I wanted to steer it pretty sorrily as well. I wanted to have the power to say, I don't want... I want two relative unknowns in the leads. I want, you know, I want it to be one shot. I don't want anyone interfering with the central idea. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm more, I, I'm able to be more protective now, but that comes with experience and a bit of status. And because, you know, I, I cashed in my chips, I've made, you know, two movies that made, you know, a couple of billion dollars. So I thought, and now's the time to make my one shot movie with no stars in it. You yeah. know? And one of the questions, I can't remember who it's from, says, would you do that again? Was, what was the process of making a one-shot movie? Was it liberating or was it, did you get you kind of locked into a process that becomes? It was fantastic. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. I loved the sort of rigor of it. I loved the fact that you had no, you had to find the right way. I love the way that the camera developed. Sometimes it was subjective, sometimes objective. Sometimes you're with the character, sometimes observing them. I found it really, um, like a sort of almost utopian situation between somewhere between theatre and film. You know, I, I, I was aware as I was doing it, I'm, I'm not sure this will ever happen again. I would love to do it again, but I would never do it uh, just for the sake of it. I, it would have to, it would have to, you know, be part of why the film exists. Um, and it was with 1917. I do have one other idea. It'll take me a while to get around to writing it or conceiving it, I'm sure. But I would like to do it again, um, but it would have to be for the right reasons, you know. Connor's got a question. Connor's a graduate of our editing course, so nice of him to pop by. He says, hi, Sam, on a series like Bond, is there still room for experimentation in the edit when a significant part has been storyboarded? Were there any deleted scenes or beats in Skyfall or Spectre that you were sad to see go? Thanks, Connor. There, there's room always for experiment. And there's, you know, Bond is surprisingly, they're surprisingly open to, um, to daring ideas. You know, that's one of Barbara's great strengths. Um, you know, so when, you know, we pitched Silver's arrival in, in uh, you know, Javier Bardem's character in Skyfall, it was A, it was going to be one long shot, and B, he was going to, it was going to be a homoerotic seduction. You know, he's going to feel him up and, you know, do everything except, you know, <laughs> give him a big French kiss. Um, and they're like, great. Yeah, that's great. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> it's like okay well that's what we did so you know that they, they they do once they if they think it's a good idea it's a good idea they will occasionally say that doesn't feel like bond um i felt very strongly that i wanted it edited uh, in a more i wanted to shoot it in a more old school way i didn't want to go down that sort of post born handheld camera unbelievably kinetic editing route that i felt that had Quantum was a slightly, forgive me for this, less good version of, of, of Bourne, you know, and Greengrass had done such a sensational job with it. I just thought, and it's just not how I shoot or I, or I edit in my head. Um, so I was pushing for things like there's a, you know, there's a scene in the, in the, in the Shanghai office tower, which is a fight in silhouette, which is just one long push in. Um, for example, all that first arrival of Silver being one long shot. So, so I was how, 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 how much have they storyboarded and how much are you? I, I storyboarded, um, I, I say they, I mean, I, I, I storyboarded with, I had three storyboard artists. Um, I, I storyboarded certain key sequences, but I, I, I find that unless you're working in a high style, storyboarding, you know, is really about getting on the same page as the cinematographer. And by the time you finish the storyboarding process, you sort of don't look at them again. You, you just, I don't follow storyboards. It's been a long time since I did that thing of pinning up the storyboards on a board and, and shooting all the, I mean, I did that a little bit on Bond because, <clears throat> you know, first unit was going to shoot 
70 percent of those storyboards but the remaining boards had to be shot by a second unit so they needed to see the frames so i would pin them up and literally put crosses through them when we shot those setups so i've done that um which is really just about getting everyone on the same page but within sequences and there were scenes that i cut from skyfall uh i can't say that i missed any of them there was a truly uh, it, it, i can't believe we actually shot this scene truly bonkers scene in which silver javier bardem's character stops on the way to to scotland to find bond in a little chef <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing yeah yeah absolutely nutty you see that in the deleted scenes yeah he's dressed as a policeman he walks into the little chef he wants a burger <laughs> and the guy he hasn't ever any money on him <laughs> little chef. it was a sort of riff on on no country for old men you know what i mean it was like yeah. he didn't get the but he couldn't you know and there was there was crowds of people it was a sort of shitty little chef anyway that would have been taking product placement to another level because yeah, yeah. it, was, it was not a scene and yeah. i remember as we shot it i thought this is never what am i doing this is never <laughs> going to be in the middle there we are. um anthony's got a great question about your work with thomas newman uh, i really admire your film sam you've collaborated on some incredible films with composer thomas newman so in your spotting session with Thomas, how do you communicate, discuss the cues with Thomas and how do you translate to Thomas the feelings and emotions you'd like the audience to feel in the film through music? Yeah, very good question. I mean, the most difficult thing to describe in words is music. The most, thing, the most difficult thing to have a conversation with anyone about is music because what I was saying to you earlier about don't discuss with an actor the effect that, that you want them to create you know it's like saying to an actor you just need to be more moving you know or just be funnier and it's like well you know that's that's not a note you know that's just a recipe for a nervous breakdown and i i think that it's the same thing with composers can we have something that's like emotional here it's like well, what does that mean you know so you've got to find a language that is sort of off center you know i, I remember george martin in an interview listening to him once saying that by the time he, he they got to sergeant pepper with the beatles John Lennon was saying stuff like, it needs to sound more orange, you know, and he would know what he meant. And, and that I totally understand because sometimes you have to reach for terminology and phrasing to describe music that you would never use in any normal discourse. Um, and, and with Tom, I'm, I'm quite sort of uh, prescriptive in that I will temp score it to a, quite a sophisticated level, often using music of his, but sometimes, like, for example, when we first started working on the Bond movies with music that wasn't his because he'd never written music like that before in any other movie. And that, I think, sometimes with Tom, it really distresses him, you know. But I find it really helps because, for me, I have to cut with music to see whether something's working or not. And finding the right, you know, one of the things that Lee Smith is so good at, and my editor, is 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 uh, putting music to things and and and, you know, finding the kind of music that works for sequences. And when you've got that music, you begin to try and define why it works. So in a movie like 1917, there was a lot of very, very quiet, low grade tones, sort of, sort of unsettling, sort of low grade tension that just existed in, in what was, we realized as we scored it, an almost unerringly present tense movie. Any, any emotion, any sentiment distanced you from the scene and took you out of the present moment. So for example, when Blake dies, there is no music. You know, it, it just couldn't hold it. It was like the movie end, it was ending, you know what I mean? He needed to deal with a dead body. He needed to find a way to, you know, steal himself, try and forget that his friend had just died in his arms and bled out and drag him to a place where he felt it was perhaps more dignified to leave him. At that point, someone else comes in and it's only when he gets in the truck with the other men and he looks back as they're driving away that he begins to realize what's just happened. So that sort of delayed emotion that happens in life, you know, you, you, you're in denial, you almost can't believe what's happened. Then he was thinking, I'm never going to see him again. And, and that was the moment for was one of the few moments in the movie where we allowed that kind of distance, that kind of objectivity. He wasn't speaking, other men were speaking around him. He was very alone. So there was a little opportunity there to open up some space for emotion in the film. That trial and error is very, very present tense, you know. Is that trial and error? In the, so in your first spotting session, are you putting music in 
places that inevitably you shift because you realize the things you've just said that the scene can't hold it or uh, how much you it try it's trial and error you just try i mean you try piece after piece after piece after piece and suddenly oh that's interesting um you know you you also have to know in your mind really where music is and where it isn't you know i think you when i'm shooting a scene i'll often think there's no, no music in this or i'll think there's going to need to be music here and i'll and i'll have a pretty clear idea by the time we put the movie together about where cues start and end um, and we'll occasionally have a fight about one cue i remember there was a long cue in american beauty um, which linked together three or four different plot strands early on in the movie it was where annette benning has lunch with the real estate king <coughs> i remember her looking over the admiringly over the menu at him and it linked together all sorts of other scenes with the teenagers and and Tom didn't want to score it. And I was absolutely adamant that, that he needed to link the whole thing. And um, in the end, I think I, I was right on that occasion, but I've definitely been wrong as well. So, you know, you, you'll have certain contentious cues which you'll go back and forth about. And then others that just work immediately. I've got a few minutes left. So I wanted to turn, there's quite a lot of questions uh, from people who are trying to make their way in the industry. And, and one of the, the questions which kind of summarizes what a lot of people are asking if you were to go back in time what advice would you give your younger self about how to navigate your way through this industry what have you learned over the, the films that you've made well i've been i've been very lucky um you know that, that i wouldn't advise <laughs> not that this is a choice but having a sort of global success with your first movie, you know, adds a bunch of pressure to your to your next movies that you may not necessarily be the most creative thing. But what it did for me was it gave me freedom, you know, to make mistakes, gave me final cut, all sorts of things that I would otherwise never have had or not for years. Um, I think um, that I would say, this is the era of the long form narrative. This is not, you know, you don't have that sort of jockeying for position award season horseshit that used to go on year after year. That's not the dominant feature of the industry anymore. You know, the sort of um, everything pivoting around November and December and how much money Harvey Weinstein is going to spend on a marketing campaign. You know, it became a very narrow focus for a long time. Television was sort of second best and it was all about five movies at the end of the year and nothing else. It's a much broader landscape now. There is still room for those movies. There's room for, but there's, you know, there's, there's giant movies being made. Um, the movie industry as a whole is less healthy in terms of the variety of movies available. But television is <clears throat> 10 times healthier than it was. Um, it's the best time to be a storyteller. But you have to be um, able to tell stories over long periods and you have to be able to, um, to regenerate within narratives in a way that is hard. But when it works, like Breaking Bad, for example, you know, or The Wire or, 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 or you know, any of the really good shows that have been out there, that's um that's extraordinary and i think that is the 21st century art i don't think that ever happened until well until the sopranos really where you felt like this is the quality of a godfather movie but taking place over 50 hours or 60 yeah. hours that's staggering you know so i think there's you know on the one hand everyone moans about the movie industry but on the other hand you know, it, it's not a director driven industry anymore. It's a, it's a showrunner driven industry. You know, in a way you could call Kevin Feige of Marvel a showrunner. You know, he's really got the overview of the whole franchise and he's driving each one individually. He's not taking the individual identity of it, those movies, you know, and, and ruining them. In fact, he's encouraging Taika Waititi to make his you know, multicolored kaleidoscopic funny one. And then he's encouraging other people to make darker ones or whatever. <clears throat> so you know that's but that's the world that we're in and i think that for me i think i would have got my head out of the two-hour narrative arc but now i've done it for 30 years i can't you know i am i am I, i'm happy to produce you know television 
but as a director I, I i can't direct 10 hours of story and keep it in my head i i, I like the feeling of starting a movie finishing it and talking about it all within the same evening i i hate the idea of sticking it out there and not knowing when anyone's watching it or where anyone's watching it and and thinking that they can pause it whenever they want to go and have a pee i just like no, that's, you're not allowed to get out. I'm trapping you in a room. That's the point, you know, you're not allowed to get out of this. So for me, 1917 was a, is a you know, it's like, right, you know, leave this movie if you dare <laughs> kind of movie, right? I don't want anyone breathing, let alone going for a wee. That's how I'm going to make this film. And I feel that about theatre too, you know, I, I, it's structured. So you sit there in a room and you can't escape. Um, but then the shape of story has changed. You know, in the old days, we, we were encouraged to think of a story as something with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And in movies now, you're encouraged to think about a movie as something with a beginning, a middle, and another beginning, because you want people to come and see the next movie. And that's what the Marvel and Star Wars structures have become, and even Bond a little bit. You know, you don't want to make people feel that it's over. So you've got to, so because what you're competing with is not another movie. You're not competing with 1917, you're competing with Game of Thrones. That's what you're, the big movies are. So, you know, understanding that way that that's changed and embracing it and going with it, I think is something that I would say to young uh, storytellers now. A thing that will always stay with me was going to the premiere of 1917. It was a great moment. I got invited, not because I know you, but I got invited to the royal premiere of 1917 at the Odeon Leicester Square. And that felt like a room, it was just, big screen experience at, at its ultimate yeah. and I think that that's something cinema can deliver that very little else it really it really can it really can and I don't want to give it you know I think if you have the I mean I know this sounds pompous but I feel it's almost a duty now as someone who can fund a large-scale movie and get people in a non-franchise event movie yeah try and make a couple more of them because you know they don't exist very much and the only people who can really make them on the whole are people who have existing yeah. resumes as film directors you know they'll give the money to me or, 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 yeah. or Nolan or whoever but you know it's tricky if you're a young filmmaker to get that kind of thing yeah. unless it's part of a series like Marvel or, or, or yeah, stuff. You need those original stories so yes you do have a duty to do that Sam. <laughs> Lydia asks a question which is, good, which is a bit pointed but it's quite a good note to answer at uh, uh, finalising she says you make your journey through the industry sound so positive is that because it was, or is it because you want to make it appealing to those entering the industry? <laughs> Very good question. Uh, it's a bit of both, I think. I do want to make it appealing. I do want to make it feel like there's wonderful opportunities out there. I do want to make you feel like, you know, that there, there are people out there that, you know, will value sparks of originality and, and real creativity, and that that can never be replaced by algorithms and and, you know, focus groups at the end of the day you know that individual voice um will out and i i do believe that by the way i think that you know i think people will people tire in the end of things that look like other things and and they're always hanker for something nomadland is a very good example you know nomadland was you know it's just refreshing it just just felt different it felt different it felt a different shape different mood different kinds of actors you know just it felt like someone was just going a little deeper in, in one area of the world. And I think that that sort of thing is, is, is what the industry thrives on. And, um, but at the same time, yeah, I think I probably airbrush some of the tricky stuff, you know, some of the interference, some of the compromises, some of the studio, you know, pushing some of the movies that I felt I kind of was not allowed to make the movie I want, like Jarhead, for example. Um, and, um, the fact that you get caught in 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 history, you know, um, that we made Jarhead during a time in, in in the Middle East when American soldiers were dying, you know, in large numbers, and we made a movie about a war in which nobody died, or no no none of the Allied, none of the American troops died, and so it was just out of time, and it felt. I mean, the New York Times described the movie as irrelevant. Well, when you spent two years working on a movie, that's hard to hear, you know. Um, I know what he meant, but I wasn't supposed to be relevant in that way. It wasn't supposed to be a contemporary film. So, you know, you you have to gird your loins. It's 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 quite it can be quite bruising. You know, um, the problem with movies is that you do spend a large chunk of your life making them, and they can be dismissed in a weekend. And I've had that happen. You know, when I say that to people, they go, "No, you haven't." I'm like, "No, I have. I really have." You know, Jarhead 
was in cinemas for two, three weeks and gone. Um, you know, away we go. Revolutionary Road came out at a time when people were losing their houses in the crash. They were in deep, deep financial shit. And then I released a movie about two beautiful people moaning about living in suburbia, you know, and go figure. It didn't go down so well, you know, I mean, but so you, you, you're a victim of timing as well, often. Um, whereas American Beauty was the perfect timing. Skyfall was the perfect timing. Olympic year, everyone felt good about being about being British. Remember that? Um, and uh, pre-Brexit, you know, and Bond jumped out of a bloody helicopter, you know, in the Olympic ceremony. And it rode in on the crest of that positive na national feeling. And so, you, you know, you are always searching to try and find a way to get into the main artery if you're, if you're interested in making a cultural artifact that lasts, you know, but at the same time, there's no guarantee and sometimes it could be cruel. So you just have to be strong. And my, you know, as I said to the graduating students in my recorded speech the other day, don't, just don't read reviews, keep yeah. yourself, keep yourself innocent of, of that and, um, and believe in yourselves, you know. Well, Zizana's written in the chat, Revolutionary Road, Heart. So I think the one thing I would say, um, is the great thing about movies is they last a long time and people change their opinions of them yeah. and how they everyone resonate. forgets that you know everyone forgets that forgets what happened to the movie when it came out and you know yeah thank you very much Dun you know duncan just said away we go is amazing. Uh, listen sam you've been so generous thank great you for the time we have a little for the students who are watching or not the students the audience who are what i'm so used to doing student q and for the audience who are watching, if you have a little message, a thank you for Sam, put it in the chat and ask, we'll send it on to him later. Sam, it's so rare that somebody of your, your you know, tremendous background and kind of profile takes the time to do something like this for just anybody who wants to rock up. So a massive thank you for doing it. Pleasure. Yeah, real, and, real uh, pleasure. Well, keep going, all of you out there. I hope you, um, you know, and whatever that little idea, that little acorn is in, in, in the back of your head, write it, direct it, make it, whatever it is, because, um, you know, it, it, there's always going to be space for original um, stories and original ideas, always. So, anyway, it's great. Thanks, to um, thanks for everything. I'll leave this, I'll leave this open because there's hundreds of messages coming here, thanks. So I'll make oh, sure right. I send this over to you. Lovely. Thank, you. To Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Take yeah. care. Bye-bye.